Well, hello, everybody. And here we are. Uh, pardon the delay. It was a computer thing. We couldn't get online. But we're back again. And this is uh, our series, Rudolf Steiner on the Grail Language, Part 3. My name is John Barnwell. I'm here north of the city of Detroit. And I'm here with Joe Visconti, the uh, award. <laughs> And his dog. And his hey, dog. Hey, what an engine, huh? Hey, get out of the window, buggy. <laughs> Anyways, uh, <laughs> okay, our friend there. Where was I? Uh, yes, and so uh, I'm here with. Uh, I'm I'm not online anymore. Okay. <laughs> uh, I am I here? Yeah. Okay. Well, I my uh, system here is a little bit dodgy today. Let's start over. Hello, everybody, and this is the series Rudolf Steiner on. The, uh, boy, I got computers att attacking me. <laughs> It's Rudolf Steiner on the Grail Language, Part 3. My name is John Barnwell. I'm here in the north of the city of Detroit. And I got all this Wi-Fi stuff attacking me. <laughs> you know what? Uh, I think uh, <laughs> this is pretty funny. Anyways, yeah, let me let me give you some sound. I, I can't... Um, my computer keeps uh, doing things uh, to prevent me from I can, acting. I can talk. Is it okay? Okay. Well, yeah, now we're okay. Now for, we're okay. For the moment. Okay. Uh, I'll probably dodge in and out because of the, the artifacts that are presenting themselves. But uh, anyways, where were we? Okay. Rudolf Steiner on the Grail Language Part 3. I'm John Barnwell. I'm north of Detroit. And I'm here with Joe Visconti, the uh, award-winning film producer, musician, uh, builder, lifelong anthroposophist like myself. And we've come here again to have another conversation regarding the Grail language. And I want to make clear that, that the Grail language is something that's, that's understood within the measure of time. And that uh, Rudolf Steiner is very to the point about that. And so I'd like to lead off with a little uh, quotation from uh, his lecture on good and evil that's in this wonderful series, The Occult Truths and Myths and Legends, Greek and Germanic Mythology, Richard Wagner, In the Light of Spiritual Science. And uh, this lecture is not available anywhere else except in this printed form that I could find, other than in German. But in here, he, he says, I've often stressed that the events taking place in our physical world are nothing other than a kind of reflected shadow of what is happening on the higher planes. For the occultist, it is clear he can only understand events in the physical world when he knows what is happening on the supersensory planes. For an occultist who has insight into the higher planes, people appear as though pulled by strings emanating from the higher worlds. This might seem to be a restraint on human freedom, but I should like to show today that this is not the case. A few examples can show how the higher worlds influence us. 
Here I must refer back to something I said earlier, that fundamentally speaking, there is no such thing as an absolute good or an absolute evil. Evil is only a kind of misplaced good. <clears throat> when something happened, let's say in the lunar period, that's the lunar period being the planetary condition before the Earth was even formed. Uh, when something happened, let's say in the lunar period, which preceded our own, and an aspect of that is transplanted onto our Earth's evolution, it appears in the present time as displaced. It was good during the moon period, but appears evil to us during the Earth phase. During the moon period, someone might have had the task of organizing urges and drives in a harmonious way, but this activity was completed when old moon came to an end. The task of the Earth period is to master drives and urges from the standpoint of manas, that is, the metal element. If someone had to live out their urges in the way Petries had to, in our epoch, they would be an evil person. Whereas in the lunar epoch, they were a wise sage. So there you have it. It's important to keep in mind when one is attempting to frame the ideas of Rudolf Steiner that you always have to take into account that time element. That's one of the things that's so unique about Rudolf Steiner's work that's not available in other sources. And uh, so given that remark, I think that I'll uh, pass off to Joe and just say, Joe, hi, how are you doing there? My Emmy, my Emmy winning uh, videographer. And uh, I'm doing pretty good, but the other, the, uh, the demons of the, uh, AI are really messing around. I saw, I think I sent you a TikTok yesterday. No, it was a YouTube. It, it's this uh, Karma Chronicles, it's called. This guy's really great. He's all anthroposophy and Steiner. And he puts a video up on TikTok saying, I cannot post this. I've tried 25 times. His work is exceptional. It's 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 animation uh, with voiceover. And it's all based on Rudolf Steiner. Different issues. Um, but he could not post this because it had to do with... Uh, with uh, uh, Mr. S, we'll call him. I'm not going to get these guys. I don't like to even call them into being, but um, it's not important that the audience understands that yet. But the, the thing is, there are forces that are um, are opposing even anthroposophy and truth being put into the sub-physical world, which is we are, we are in right now. We are in, you and I, in the sub-physical world. We've descended there through YouTube. Um but what you brought up uh, just now and read from that book, I got to get that book. Um, we spoke about indirectly yesterday uh, regarding materialistic science, how they are mining, um, you know, the periodic table discoveries, trying to uh, find out um, what the secrets are of nature in order to trademark them, patent them, turn them into products. Um, and Rudolf Steiner says materialism will increase for the next three to 400 years, and that's around the year 1920. So we, know, we have to realize we're at the very beginning of it. And what are these materialistic discoveries, these things that, that Rudolf Steiner also says uh, our men will be mining and bringing forward as miracles and we've already seen when we're holding our phones up, could you imagine this phone could do everything when we were kids in the 60s, you know, um, or the 70s, you couldn't fathom it. Um, and so it's just this tip of the iceberg. But what are these secrets, these mysteries uh, in the periodic table within nature? Um, they're nothing more than the moon sphere activity of spiritual entities that on the, our sphere, the Earth sphere, they become something different. A little different than the good and evil of that time that you just read, but more importantly, they are uh, events and activity on a different sphere that in our sphere turn into the periodic table. Uh, and that's just the beginning of it. So we have materialistic science not knowing what it's doing, fe feeling it's God, and it can do whatever it wants, uh, lab experiments on animals, torture, you name it. Uh, you know, the rise and fall of the Third Reich, we saw Adolf Hitler's henchmen experiment there um our science is just as i would say maybe not as much human but it's just as gruesome in many ways um 
And so what is that that they're doing? Not using occult development, the, the higher senses, the higher realms to be conscious as Rudolf Steiner is to bring down into this sphere helpful um, processes for medicine, for, you know, soup to nuts. And they're not doing it that way. They're doing it trial and error. They're doing it through forcing nature on the rack, as I think it was that Francis Bacon said this. He wanted to get the secrets from nature by putting her on the rack. Uh, and so, you know, there, there's so much in our sphere now that is is not understood. Um, but the healthy way is through, you know, I'll call it white magic. I'll call it positive uh, anthroposophical thoughts. Uh, the development of the, this is what we're speaking, the whole uh, show here is the grail language. To learn the language, to start to understand how um, events because uh, the language is not, <laughs> it's in pictures. And so um, it's so important to realize that we, we cannot, as you just said, be judges of just about anything without finding the rudimentary causes in the higher planes and in past spheres as well. This is a kicker right here, as well as future spheres, because Rudolf Steiner also states that streaming in from the future out of the necessity of tomorrow <laughs> in time and space, events are occurring in your life that may not be karmic, but they may need to be done uh, in tomorrow that they're being done today. So this time that you're speaking about is everything. And without that approach and outlook to reality, uh, everyone it will just come up with their own uh, opinions, uh, call things facts that are not facts. And, uh, and then we see the ideology, the uh, mind control that's occurring in our world now, and this whole push to get everyone to believe the opinions and the um, false ideologies and realities of life, stripping away our freedom. Yes, the, uh, the challenge of subnature is, is never been more developed than it is now. But the whole idea of deriving one's understandings from the life of the senses, from that uh, reflected image that was referred to at the beginning of the quotation that I read. And so there's an element in that way of looking at the world that can be very, very effective within certain realms, but yet gets through extrapolation, they just take the concepts derived from the mechanical processes of nature that are valid in their own realm, and they transplant it into the realm of the living. And that's not, that's not the truth. That's not what's going on there. And so they end up creating this whole nest of ideas that they have to revise every year because the theory theories never last. These these ways of anytime you derive your uh, theory from just the life of the senses, it's only effective in a very limited realm. And because they attempt to try and make assumptions beyond that uh, realm of of, of uh, fact you know they discover a fact and then they extrapolate the significance of that fact and because they're not incorporating the super sensible realities of being they can never get to a true understanding of uh, what they're watching because basically what they're they're perceiving isn't isn't what they think it is it's actually the projected images from higher spiritual beings that have manifested this world in which we live through a great deal of sacrifice multitudinous spiritual beings have all contributed through their ideation to give us this world of form and, and substance and so uh that's and, and that's, that's the that's dilemma and that's what I was calling the activities on the moon sphere, what you just said. There's activity that they brought in that becomes something else on a different sphere. I was talking with my girlfriend last night, and um, we were talking about love and uh, this and that. And over the years, um, how there's quotes out there. There is no reasons or why 
to be to love even its lowest form of human love not hierarchies there is no reason when i love you i don't know why how many reasons can i say it doesn't work you love and it's a state of being and then i said to her when she was speaking about that quote somewhere i said which is why you can't prove that you love someone and everyone's always trying to prove that they love i did this i did that i did this all all egotistical things are trying to measure something that there is no basis for so just think about it. And so if you if you translate that simple human Valentine's kind of thing up to the higher level, what is the root cause of creation of love? But why? And, and so is there no whys and reasons why the hierarchies love us and God loves us? And why, why is that important? Because in the times we're living, so many are turning to atheism uh, to false religions and doctrines because they can't conceive of a God that would allow horrors and the things that are in the world. Again, this goes back to the cosmology. What's your world outlook on where God is and where human freedom is and how is the whole game set up in Mount Olympus? What's going on? But it really gets back to love. And so what comes out of all of that is fear. There's no way to know, to understand, then there's fear because God forbid there's a world conception that's not like the Catholic Church or, you know, Protestant or even uh, Muslim, Buddhism, and it doesn't have a fixed uh, method of, uh, of uh, ritual. Then wait a minute, well, who's in, who's in control? Jehovah, I'm a jealous God. It will have no other God before me. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What does that mean? There's other gods? And so we're in that place where there are no gods. There are no authority figures anymore. Nobody trusts or believes anything. Um, love is here. It shines at us with the sun and the food and the water and life and a love of our families. Yet it can't be quantified because it's love. And it, it, But it is the thing that transcends. This is what the ego is. What spirit, self, modest, booty, atman that are on our way coming is the sending of the kingdom and the transforming of our lower natures that are egotistical and earthbound into higher. And the word sacrifice sounds like a bad word, but what it really means is pouring out. And knowing that I have this thing right here, grace, my cup says grace. Knowing that you don't lose by pouring out yourself and your being. You don't lose your being. That's the mechanistic model of, of materialism and quantification. And if I give, I won't have. But it doesn't work that way. So the word sacrifice gets misused as though, oh, I don't want to sacrifice. Oh, I don't want to donate. I don't want to do that. I'll lose. And so there's no way to understand that you're not losing. You're pouring forth your being because we're immortal spiritual beings that we're always replenished and uh so it time the time element you spoke about is so important because it it really locks if it's the wrong uh, conception of time the materialistic one it locks everyone into a fixed timeline of fear dates bills money cash urgency need um, that's a fact of life but the other time that's the healing time that Christ uh, as you've always said in your programs has brought into uh, re repair and give us back time is another way that miracles can happen in your daily life. And we've all seen them, simple things with timing and events and opportunities that should not have happened. We all know it. That's the working of Christ. And how does that language come if we don't know it how, and we have to learn it? How does it come? By, by being open to the reality once it occurs. Oh, my God, this just happened. It shouldn't have happened. It couldn't have happened. Small miracles. And to identify them and hold on to them in, in the world that's materialistic, that wants to flush them, you know, throw them away. It's just an accident. It's just an error. It's just a probability and statistic. It means nothing. There really is no cosmic Christ. There is no grace. There is no higher realm that will bring you that uh, reoccurrence of life and, um, and love. And so this is the battle we're in. Yes, well, uh, to, to uh, that was kind of a long presentation you did there, which is good. But, uh, to, <laughs> go back, to go back to the beginning of that, 
it's a, there's a simple answer to to uh, the question that people have regarding God, you know, and that's answered in the Gospel of John. God is love. Okay. And so, but what does that mean? You know, and so you you can go to, uh, oh, I don't know, you go to say, uh, understanding the, the history of mankind, when you get into Rudolf Steiner's work, he talks about the various folk souls and that there was propagated, and propagation is a good word because it has to do with the familial relationship of the people, that there's a propagation of love through that whole idea of the continuation of, of that particular tribe or group and so forth. But that with the Christ impulse and the impulse of, of Jehovah in, in the Old Testament, both of them have to do with, with levels of being that are beyond the folk soul, that it includes all mankind, all of earth evolution. And so you see the Christ appearing uh, as the burning bush, for example, or the the thunder and lightning on Mount Sinai. And so you see that working within the forces of nature, but that that was an impulse that was taken toward the turning point of time, which is the incarnation and crucifixion and resurrection of Christ, that is the mystery of Golgotha. And so how is one to be able to take that to other people and other lands? And uh, regarding that, in the same lecture, Rudolf Steiner clarifies. He says, we need to bear in mind here that at first Christianity tried to grow into the various other forms of religion. To begin with, we see just a small Jewish community in Palestine, and this remained very small. A principle such as the one contained in Christian teaching is not something folk souls would easily have imposed upon them. The Apostle Paul was able to reach the pagans by initially leaving their thoughts as he found them and then used their religious forms to imbue them with the Christian essence. In the southern regions of Europe, they held services to Mithras. These were similar to the present sacrifice of the Mass. The pagans in those areas adopted Christianity because they could keep their cherished Mithras festival. It was similar with the Germanic people and their festival, which as Christmas became a Christian symbol. Their sanctified ancestors were adopted as Christian saints. In this way, Christianity became established in ever new regions and peoples. It was Christianity's adaptability that made this possible. The Christian religion spread more and more, but because of these many different forms, it needed a powerful center. And this is the Roman papacy. All the harms that were later perpetrated by Christianity are bound up with this world historic mission of the papacy. And so you see that the, it had to make a shift from being able to, to uh, come into relationship with the super sensible realm, it, it transformed into a doctrine and, and a, a system of legalism. And so you see that the, the Church of Rome is there. The church fathers in the East were philosophers, but the church fathers in the West were lawyers, basically. And so what they're doing is codifying and, and presenting laws in the realm of the senses. You know, do this, don't do that. And so that whole approach of external authority uh, supplanted that inner inspirational level that was so prevalent in the early centuries of Christianity. And so now we're at a point to where we have to be able to reawaken our relationship to the super sensible, but with the gifts that have been gleaned from this whole intellectual development that, that culminated in 1879 in November that, that 
to have the form that, that's ready to receive the inspiration of the spiritual world. And we've talked before regarding the, the re-articulation of the brain and the frontal lobe and all of that in preparation for receiving the inspiration of Michael. But that, as Rudolf Steiner says, that this would atrophy were it not uh, cultivated through the uh, advancing of one's knowledge in spiritual science. So at the very least, one should be approaching it artistically or through myths and legends in preparation for being able to develop a picture language in which you can convert your, your thinking into, into the realm of, of pictures. And through that, we spiritualize the consciousness soul. Bravo, bravo, that was good. I like that. Um, yep, that's where we are. And that's picture consciousness um, is how it comes. And if, if people don't know and, and haven't caught it, some people can hear um, first before they, you know, clear audience, they may not know that's what it is. They'll just hear something, but it'd be very quick, very quiet. A, a picture will usually precede them hearing it but they don't capture it then there's others who see something before they hear or if they do hear uh, as an intuition as a small thing i'm going to go to the mall today or a flash of something you're going to do it's happening to mankind 24 7. one of the reasons the darker forces have been bringing out so much technology and trying to to um, mechanize the pictures that are being broadcast to us through the outer external realm is to uh, bla blast and drown out these etheric images that are coming through the etherealization of the blood where we get our intuition our pictures and so there's a war going on uh, like a media war <laughs> in our own being where um, so much wants to come up and it usually will come up this is important too a little little uh, hack a, a spirit hack i'll call them well you know they have life hacks we'll call this a spirit hack usually when you get busy washing the dishes getting the vacuum cleaner out whatever some little task boom that's when the images will come in from the intuition when you're so when you're watching tv you're on the phone and you're focused on entertainment and being you know given information to brainwash you <laughs> once you move away from that and you clean the toilet or you're washing the kitchen floor everybody's done this we all know it what's really happening you would say oh just my subconscious mind well why is it doing it now well because my my conscious mind is inactive right now and i'm into my will is more uh, in play then my feelings or my thinking, my thinking doing second nature. I'm taking this, I'm plugging it in, I'm folding the towels. So the wheel is actually occurring. It's the leader. And when that happens, that's when the, or take a walk, that's when all of a sudden the pictures start to come in. And the processes of, of your daily life, of things that you've been working on, but also as you open up the frontal lobe with spiritual concepts, more uh, from the higher worlds will come through also. So you'll start to see like John and I and Doug and so many others that are, that are into this as we talk and chat, we notice more working in that world and that language. We're speaking uh, about things and then something new comes in, something we all could have known, read before, known 20, 30, 40 years ago, comes in refreshed because there's an activity of these spiritual beings that are within us. And so the thing about washing the car, doing this, when you get your daily flashes of what to do and intuitions or something in a family argument or whatever, you can also gather together in those moments. So meditation isn't the only way to receive uh, using the will forces and being active, thinking about um, these spiritual concepts. You're, you'll be using your frontal lobe completely um, free which is strange because it's free. It doesn't need to have regimented. Uh, we will take two minutes only and breathe this way. And then a picture will descend. Uh, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> it works humanly. And, uh, and that love aspect. It's, so the spiritual world is looking to love and descend and bring us these gifts, these, this, this grace all day long. And uh, we just have to want to be interested in the spiritual world and reality.
Yes. Uh, if you could continue for a, a second, I have to yeah. find something. Go ahead, go ahead. I trigger something. And this is exactly what we're talking about. Once we start doing this, things come out, things come out. It would be like anything else, um, except for when you're doing work in the material world, you'll usually run, we're building a house or something. And we all know what we're doing. Either you got to go to the lumber yard to get more screws or nails or something. But in this world, uh, the, the things we're speaking about, it's things we know all about. But the origins, I'm looking out my window, the origins of the world, the normal origins of things are it's a gift it's the hierarchies have been building this in all day long this is working in our body working in the world so it's a bottomless pit of newness uh, you'll never run out and um in new uh, understandings and insights will come in almost like facets in a diamond because it's alive it's living and it's not to be limited or put into a one answer Did you find it? Not yet? Okay. Hopefully I don't lose him. Hopefully I'm on. I'm in the show. So um, are we back, John? You're next? Your turn? No? Okay. He's still hunting for it. So the facets of the diamonds, um, as I was speaking about, are, are miracles and they're beautiful um, um, reflections on what's happening from the spiritual world, and then to identify the processes so that your conscious is what the left brain's about, bringing it into the physical world. Thank you. Yeah, sorry for the, the okay. rough uh, transition there. But uh, so this whole way of, of holding uh, the concept of the sacred, that is, is what the grail language is all about and, and to be able to have a receptacle for the in-streaming inspiration that that derives from developing one's relationship to the christ because christ is with you he said i shall be with you always or he also said whenever two or more gathered in my name i am in the midst of them but in light of this there was a lecture that Rudolf Steiner gave in Cologne on April 11th of 1909 from Collected Works, Volume 109. And uh, it's the event of Golgotha, the Brotherhood of the Holy Grail and the Spiritualized Fire. But he says, and I quote, with this aim, a brotherhood of initiates who preserved the secret was founded, the Brotherhood of the Holy Grail. They were the guardians of the secret this fellowship has always existed. It is said that its originator took the chalice used by Christ Jesus at the Last Supper and in it caught the blood flowing from the wounds of the Redeemer on the cross. He gathered the blood, the expression of the eye in this chalice, the Holy Grail, and the chalice with the blood of the Redeemer, with the secret of the replica, of the eye of Christ Jesus was preserved in a holy place in the brotherhood of those who through their attainments and their initiation are the brothers of the Holy Grail. The secret is a reality. Only men must allow themselves to be summoned through spiritual science to understand this in order that as they contemplate the Holy Grail, the Christ eye may be received into their being. To this end, they must understand and accept what has come to pass as fact, as reality. But when men are better prepared to receive the Christ ego, then it will pour in greater and greater fullness into their souls, end quote. And so that it's just, it's almost too profound to comment on. And so we have this idea that, that the there's the fourfold being of man, that's physical, etheric, astral, and ego, or the I, the I am, the I am. And uh, just to answer a question somebody had asked earlier is, uh, uh, David Vaughn, are Jehovah and Yahweh interchangeable? Yes, okay. And so that refers to the realm of the exousiae. And, uh, 
the exousiae being the spirits of form, Jehovah being that spirit of form that as a sacrifice stayed with earth evolution when the conditions had changed so that the other uh, exousiae went uh, with the sun, when the sun separated from the moon and the earth that were together, then the sun separated off and later the moon was separated from the earth through the activity of Jehovah. And so you have that whole idea of the, the story of Genesis and, and the story of the Adam and Eve and all of that. That refers to the new form of propagation as mankind descended into the physical world. And so you have, I didn't know I was gonna be going there, but that's an interesting point to add because you see in this, it's a very dynamic story in that things are always going through change. And so to draw conclusions based on a limited assessment of, of developments is where one can lead to errors. And so you, you made reference to the Karma Chronicles, for example. That's a good example because what I see there is, is uh, and I don't know the people that did it, but I have a feeling there, there are people that are outside the U.S. that are videographers, and, and Douglas and I chatted about it a little bit, and they're, they're pretty new to anthroposophy, and so uh, some of the details are not accurate in, in those productions, but the production quality is very impressive, you know? And so I, I don't want to discourage anybody who's attempting to unlock the secrets uh, of the language of the grail, you know? And Rudolf Steiner's work, like I've said time and time again, is 36 and a half feet, which is why I, I retreat into the realm of questions. If you go to my books, you find that I, I present people with questions. I don't attempt to assume that I have all the answers. And so when you try to give a definitive version such as are in those videos, it, it leads to misunderstanding. And But I'd be happy if they contacted me. I'd, I, I'd chat with them, whatever. Yeah, it appears that they, um, it appears that the uh, videos that they're putting together are influenced to take anthroposophy rudolf steiner's works and bring them to an audience that um could comprehend them and in that translation that's where there's many uh i don't even want to call them inaccuracies generalizations um and it's e it's so easy to um to go offline but i want to say something you just talked about about the um cosmic the christ uh descending into us this is important because uh, it Bringing, and how, how do I put this in words? Um, opening your frontal lobe, bringing in spiritual information is a form of communion. And we are sacrificing something. We're bringing our blood. This is where the etherealization of the blood, we're bringing our blood up. This Christ is descending into the grail. This is process is happening um, in, a, in a form where the body of anthroposophy the body of this knowledge um, is that Christ is descending in us with it. So it's not what we would think when we go to church. There's the offertory. There's um, the, the every four, the four parts of the mass that's occurring all the time within humanity. But without this, without Christ bringing it to us, I'm, I can't find the words to put it because it came to me as you were speaking about Christ more and more coming into us. Um, it is through this information. I'm going to let you take over here, but uh, we are much more of our being, our blood, uh, our body, our organism is tra being transformed spiritually with this. I don't want to call it information, but it's it's life, uh, love, and life. It's transforming us. Doesn't mean we don't have sinful natures so and we don't have, you know, we're not perfect. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with more and more Christ is incorporating with us as in the, the spiritual beings uh, working under this umbrella are coming in. It's a total transformation of your, your entire being, um, more than just information that you read in a book. 
Yes. Well, the the uh, basic terminology that Rudolf Steiner refers to that, that can clarify what was in that quotation I read is the concept of spiritual economy, and that's that's a difficult yeah. subject to say the least. But there is a there's a whole uh, published. Uh, the Principles of Spiritual Economy is, is a collection of, of lectures that pertains to that. But in there, Rudolf Steiner talks about how through the development of, of mankind, certain individuals come to a level of development to where uh, they transform their vehicles, whether the astral body or the etheric body, uh, or even the physical body, although that's much later. But he and he gives examples of, of great saints that that had so perfected those vehicles that after they passed on, that those vehicles are preserved in the spiritual world. And that's one of the mysteries of the Grail is that you have these perfected etheric and astral bodies that could be incorporated into individuals. Uh, either they incarnate and utilize that vehicle or that vehicle can overlight them and inspire them for an extended period of time or for just brief moments of time. Uh, it's all within the, the realms of variability, but that there's also the transformed vehicles of the incarnation of Christ. And those are the most sacred possession in earth evolution and that we can develop our relationship to those transformed vehicles of Christ because he performed the completion of the journey of mankind as an example to mankind. So this divine spiritual being takes up a human form and fully enters into the humanity of that human form and transforms it through the principles of love and wisdom to the point to where he serves as the example for all mankind. And so that gives one insight into that final sentence of that quotation. And he says, uh, the secret is a reality. Only men must allow themselves to be summoned through spiritual science to understand this in order that as they contemplate the Holy Grail, the Christ I may be received into their being. To this end, they must understand and accept what has come to pass as fact, as reality. But when men are better prepared to receive the Christ ego, then it will pour in greater and greater fullness into their souls. So it's very, very uh, to the point what he's saying, if you have the surrounding concepts to be able to understand what it is he's referring to. And so that's the mystery. That's what's contained in the Holy Grail, yeah. is that that sacred presence of the Christ. Yeah. And so in coming to that, and it's it's born by the Grail maidens, right? They, they're, they're carrying the Grail and they're carrying the bleeding lance that, that the, has shed the excess blood to to uh, eliminate the egoism of the blood because the blood carries the ego principle and by Christ sacrificing the blood, he was able to eliminate some of that excess egoism so that it would be transformed into that, that it's a principle of love, that the ego actually is a drop of love in the human being. It's just that people don't recognize it as such because, well, it's like when you go out and when you're hanging out with the kids in the yard, you know, and, and you, you, don't, you don't have the kind of expectations of them that you would of a mature individual because they're children. And so when you're around people and you can see them as that uh, unopened flower, and that that time has to happen, that cultivation has to happen to be able to develop the capacity to be able to receive. And so that's that's like Kabbalah, for example. That what does that mean? That means to receive. It's like a or a tradition. It's something that's passed on. And so there is this this Grail language that's been passed on, but it's been passed on in uh, the pictorial language 
such as the pictorial language of scripture. That's why scriptures are in picture language. That's why myths and legends are in picture language, because that's where we're headed. We have to be able to take our thinking and transform it into picture language. And that's the first stage, because that leads us to the element of manas, that leads us to be able to uh, enter into the spirit self. But the consciousness soul has to be first transformed into the spiritual soul. And then through that striving, it creates the capacity to be able to transform the astral into the spirit self. And so that's the overcoming of that lower passion nature that's transformed into love. Amen, brother. And so when, pe when people are praying to a saint, are doing Catholics do novenas like I do sometimes to a saint? What are they really praying to or asking for? Think about that. This, the bodies of the saints that are preserved. What's really occurring with all of that, and what's occurring with Santeria when they use Catholic saints to do black magic with? So um, it's a two-edged sword out there. But there's there's much more. So people would say, "Well, I, I can't believe in that." And it's just I've I've uh, programmed myself to believe that that saint could bring me a miracle, uh, or you're named after a saint, your middle name, or you're, you're if you're Catholic, you have a uh, confirmation name, and uh, so there's there's a lot to it. It's not all um, I, what's the right word. It's it's become twisted <laughs> in time, but the rudimentary reasons why uh, this, they were sainted and the miracles that were performed and what that means and the spiritual bodies that are being preserved, uh, whether it's overlit or it's assisting, uh, again, all through Christ, all through the Holy Grail, all of it, because that's who they have, the saints, serve. Well, they have that, uh, the as it's presented, for example, in Buddhism, they talk about the Nirmanakaya, what the Nirmanakaya is, is a transformed astral form, like the Nirmanakaya of the Buddha, for example. And then you have the Sambhogakaya, and the Sambhogakaya is a transformed etheric vehicle. And then you have the highest form they talk about is the Dharmakaya, and the Dharmakaya is transformed physical. So you see that these are, these are universal uh, concepts that are available in all true initiatic traditions. And that was the skill of uh, St. Paul that was able to translate the Christ mystery into forms that were understandable to people of other cultures and to lead them to Christ. And that's it's just the unending depth that can happen when one uh, becomes realized through Christ. And, and like Rudolf Steiner had said, you know, uh, that people that think that's so complicated with the old Saturn and old sun and old moon and all that. He says, but that's the Christ language. If we uh, wish to put questions to Christ, that what we need is to be able to uh, have a language to be able to convey exactly what it is we're, we're asking questions about, you know, and then, of course I'm paraphrasing the general idea, but it's, that's why we learn this language and the law of seven and the law of 12 and, and how there's the relationship in space and time unfolding in a sevenfold mystery through the 12 fields of space and, and all that cosmic mystery. And so uh, there we are. But uh, I want to thank everybody for showing up here. We don't want to burden you over much. Uh, these things are uh, difficult enough, as they say. But as for myself, I, I want to uh, be so thankful uh, to the support that, that I've received here from so many people. But this podcast has been made possible by the generous support of Tyla and Douglas and Vadim and Vivian and Jenna and Neil and Lee and Tom and Christian and Mark and Paula and Rick and Michael and and Anil and Fred and so many other people, uh, Ray and Whitney, James and Marilyn. And I want to thank you all and and all of the, 
you that I didn't mention, love you too. And, uh, but uh, if you're interested in buying me a cup of coffee for my efforts, that's paypal.me forward slash John Barnwell 888. And I have two books, as you may know, you may have been here before, but if you haven't, my first book is The Arcana of the Grail Angel, The Spiritual Science of the Holy Blood and of the Holy Grail. It's a study developed out of the work of Rudolf Steiner of the underground streams of esoteric Christianity, which flowed from the Brotherhood of the Holy As a forward by my buddy Douglas Gabriel, great many diagrams and 640 pages. Unfortunately, currently... the grail diagrams as I call them and they give you that but uh, yeah they're having trouble connecting here but uh, you could uh, you could still get those from me I have a few copies left and you can uh, contact me through the academia link below uh, private message system for me on Facebook hasn't been working the last few days. So uh, I would recommend going through the academia link below and uh, we can arrange to have them shipped to you whether you're in, in the U.S. or outside of it. So there, that's a lot to remember. I can click like and uh, subscribe to my channel and, and hopefully uh, our future broadcasts won't have so many technical difficulties. Uh, and Oswald, uh, yeah, well, uh, he's asking this question. Uh, any comments on the Grail language versus the Green language, also known as the Bird language and her Hermeticism? Yeah, it's the same thing, basically. Different modalities of the same thing. The Signatura Rerum, the language of all things. And uh, But I want to thank Joe for his wonderful contributions and to struggle with these difficult ideas and uh, good luck on our friends over at the Karma Chronicles. That, like I said, if they want to contact myself or Douglas or, or Joe or any one of us that, to help clarify some of their work, uh, their, their, their images are, are brilliant, but they're, they're still uh, have a way to go on some of the d descriptives. I'll reach out, I'll, I will reach out to them and see if I can connect with them. Yeah. Because they, uh, out of... I, wa I don't want to discourage any sincere. Right. Sincere. Well, they're, they're doing such good work, and I'm not sure. They, they say right on their TikTok channel that, you know, from the works of Rudolf Steiner. So they're mm -hmm. they're trying. And, yeah. uh, and uh, but there's always, you know, the last thing I would like to say is that, as we've talked about so many times, this wisdom, this knowledge, it's alive it's living there's never i got it all and i got a, a degree in it and now i am know everything it every day you learn a little bit more or discover more you realize that you're like you said you're thrown back into kindergarten <laughs> <laughs> anyways well uh thank you so much joe and uh we'll see you uh in our next endeavor